right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to our BAM session today. Uh, people are piling through the doors and uh, looks like we have a good crowd. I actually like it when I do these Zoom calls to have, if you have a camera, uh, hit your camera. We'd like to see all your smiley faces. So uh, it's always nice to see that we have real people here in the room. Uh, now, uh, one, one caveat I'll say, uh, we actually had one of our agents went to a, a Zoom session. Uh, it wasn't one of ours, but it was from another uh, organization that was doing this. It was a big national Zoom session that they did. And, uh, you know, thousands of people were on this Zoom call and everyone had their cameras on, but one person didn't know that the cameras were on and she was trying to multitask, I guess. I didn't see this. I heard about it from our agent. And uh, the one uh, woman, she decided this is a great time to take a bath. So uh, she took a bath uh, in the middle of the Zoom session on camera. And uh, from what I understand, nobody heard anything that was communicated in the entire session. Uh, so so if, uh, make sure you don't do that today. Uh, we don't want any of that. So no distractions. We don't want any distractions there like that. So, uh, but uh, really glad to have everyone here. Uh, we got hundreds of people in here uh, today and uh, we're probably gonna max out our uh, our space that we have allotted for these. And I'm kind of giving a little bit of time for people to come in because uh, it just takes a little bit of time for them to get through the doors. But uh, I thought I'd start out by introducing myself. My name's Chris Russell. I'm the owner of Plum Tree Realty. Uh, we actually uh, started Plum Tree about 12 years ago. Uh, we have grown to hundreds of agents all over Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Florida. Uh, we, we are rated number six in Ohio for independent brokerages, so it's been a wild ride. So we we do these training events every Monday. We do a broker agent mastermind. And today, uh, due to the gravity of the situation, uh, we thought it would be important just to let as many people in as possible so we can kind of get our heads together around what's going on with, uh, with, with, with this settlement uh, from NAR. So to start things off, I thought it would be good uh, for me to show you a quick video clip. And so I'm going to try to share my screen here and show a quick video. I want to show this video, which kind of gives a synopsis of what's been going on. What does it mean for home prices and how much you will pay if you sell your home or if you buy a home? Joining me now, lead attorney for the state of Missouri, who originally oh took on the National Association of Realtors, Michael Ketchmark, and Compass Real Estate Broker and Million Dollar Listing Los Angeles star, Josh Flagg. Uh, Michael, let me begin with you. Are you satisfied with this result? Is this given all the effort and energy that you put into the case in Missouri, an outcome that you appreciate? Yeah, I think it's awesome. What, what happened is we had a jury that came back with the $1.8 billion verdict. And now the National Association of Realtors, they've listened to what the jury said. The jury found that there's been conspiracy that and there's delusion the NAR and these large real estate companies. And they said, we need to put a stop to it. We need to return the housing market to the free market and, and let homeowners who own their home make their own decision. And let's not force them to pay the buyer's commissions. And that's exactly what the, what's happening here. It's, it's a fundamental change in the way that, that the housing market's gonna work. I call it hitting the reset button and technology is not gonna have a chance to work on behalf of homeowners instead of against them. By the way, how many of your blood pressure goes up at least 20 points when you hear this guy talking? <laughs> just wonder. I just out of curiosity, Michael, do you own your home? Yes, absolutely, own my house. My and did you life. use a, a, sell, a buyer's broker when you bought your house? Sure, when we bought our house 20 years ago, we had no idea uh, the, the, about things like the iPhone had didn't exist. We didn't have access to it. We, we actually met with the real estate agent at a local Perkins and, and had a cup of coffee and went through a phone book like a uh, material called the MLS. And, and we looked at it that way and we went around through open houses. Now you go online, you do it. Now you use tech. By the way, what he's saying is the last time he bought a house was 20 years ago. So in other words, he has no clue what agents do today. Just make a footnote of that. I use the red VCRs and, and watch movies yeah. on Friday night at, from Blockbuster. Don't do that. And so technology does have a way of changing. Could you see yourself using a, an agent again to buy another house? 
Sure, I think agents are great, and, and, and I absolutely would use an agent. I'd use an agent to help sell my house. I'd use an agent to help buy my house. But what I wouldn't do is force the homeowners to pay for it. I wouldn't use the, make the homeowners be the ones that they want to list a house to go find an agent. You don't make them pay for the other side. It's just there's no other industry in our country where that exists. And in the United States used to be the only place that... By the way, he said there's no other industry where that exists. What he's not understanding is that it's actually paid by the listing broker, right? So it's the same thing as if you hire landscapers to come over to your house and uh, you talk to the owner of the landscaping company, he lays out the, the plans and then you pay him the, you know, the several thousand dollars. Is he the one that shows up at your, at your house? Maybe, maybe not. But there, chances are there's going to be other people that you did not pay. Those are subcontractors that he has. And that's the same thing that we have in the real estate world. So he's really misidentifying what's going on there. Happen. It doesn't happen that way anymore because now NAR is coming forward and changes are coming. And, and I know it's scary, scary to people and it's scary to people who are used to the way that it was. But, but look, it changes. We used to have travel agents where you'd want to book a, a, a airplane flight or a hotel. You'd pay 10% to a travel agent. We don't use those anymore, do we? But people still travel. People are still going to buy houses. They're just going to be more affordable. and less. So what he's trying to do, make no mistake about it, he just wishes realtors would go away. Commissions, and that's a wonderful thing for our country. Josh, what's your prediction about what happens to the system as a whole if the judge approves the settlement? Well, I think I should just retire. I mean, I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, when I go to a when I go to a restaurant, right? I pay for the service, I pay for the food, I pay for the experience. I don't eat home every night. Uh, do you expect to go to the restaurant and just not pay the bill and leave? Does that make sense? What I'm saying. So, the, what are real estate agents? Why are we in business? Why are we here? If 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 we're not needed and we shouldn't get paid, why are we just why don't just the homeowners put their house on the market for sale and just let the buyer go direct and see how that turns out when you negotiate the deal? Great question, Josh. I'll answer it. When you go to a restaurant, you're expected to pay your own bill. When I go to the restaurant, I sit down at my house. I pay my own person. You're at the restaurant. You don't look over to the person sitting next to you and say, hey, pay my bill. While you're here, why don't you pick up my tab? In our country, if you own... But that's not really a, a proper analogy. What you're doing is you're paying the owner of the restaurant and he pays the people who actually did the services for, for uh, preparing the meal. And you ought to be able to sell it without having to pay the other person. Why don't you retire? Right. At, uh, so so you're, you're a very capable person. Now went on your website and saw it. You're, you're, you're involved in listing some houses for $11, $12 million. You don't need to pay a buyer's agent $300,000 to show that Why not? house. But okay, do you hear the argument he's making? He's saying that this guy who sells these expensive homes makes uh, huge amounts of money and it's just not fair. But what is Michael Ketchmark doing? Do you realize how much money? He's making hundreds of millions of dollars off of this case. Uh, realtors make three to 6% usually, maybe. And uh, he's, I, I find it really hard to take somebody who's making 30, 40, 50% commission on these lawsuits critiquing agents at a three to six percent so and that's his argument and i find it to be absurd why not because it's a gross overpayment it's one of the reasons that why? Are out of control in our country it's one of the reasons but why tell me why three hundred thousand dollars is a great tell me why three hundred thousand million dollars a year why is three hundred thousand dollars a gross overpayment don't you know what the broker is that hey i just showed up at the house and i'm just showing it you think that's all that they do Absolutely not. But if you're if you're able to represent somebody who's buying the eleven million dollar house, have that person pay you. Justify what it's worth. Use the free market. Don't make the homeowner. Don't capture the homeowner. But, but, but what about when the buyer? Hold it's on. an old but system, Josh. Like, what about when the buyer is going to buy a house? He's not paying attention. Why, it's a why, why, why are you online here, or why are you on this show defending a system that the entire industry has gone away from? Keller Williams because it's worked forever, Remax and there's no reason to interrupt. It's worked. I have a question, no, Josh. Not abandoned it, but you're working for a company that refuses to abandon it. You cannot continue to rip off money from homeowners because you don't want to retire. I actually take offense of that. Rip off, I mean, rip off the buy. I, I take offense to that. How many of you take offense to that? <laughs> I take offense to that. I find it absurd uh, that somebody that's making the amount of money that he's making on, on lawsuits would say that it's a rip off. 
uh, for realtors uh, to be uh, making money on deals as well. So anyway, it's laughable, Chris. It's laughable. It He's making thirty-five percent contingent fee on that lawsuit of what one point five billion, and that's not exorbitant, but our but our commissions are. It's laughable. Yeah, uh, it's absurd. Thank you, Rob. It's it's just crazy to think uh, that uh, people are uh, doing this. By the way. Um, what I'm going to do here, I'm, what I typically do in our BAM sessions is I'll do about 20 minutes of, of uh, my perspective on things, and then we're going to have about 20 minutes of Q&A. So what I want you to do is think about some of the things, issues that you have with it. If you have questions, uh, I probably don't have all the answers, but we have several of us in this room uh, who will have plenty of great answers. So I encourage you to jot down some uh, questions and then we'll share those things uh, together. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, if you have uh, if you have questions you don't want to share them on camera, feel free to write those in the the chat and uh, we'll we'll get to those as well. Also, I'd love to know who all was here today. So if you don't mind, uh, jot your name down, maybe your brokerage. Uh, you know, we're plum tree, but we've got plenty of uh, other brokerages represented and we'd just like to see who's here today. So uh, just jot your name down and say hi. So we'd love to, love to hear from you. So let me, let me uh, give you some other uh, things I wanted to share with you. First thing I want to say is I'm not a lawyer. This isn't intended to be legal advice. I'm a real estate broker helping agents navigate the complexities of this crazy market. So uh, I'm just simply here to help in any way I can. And today's big idea, if you don't get anything else out of this session today, here's what I want you to get. There's no need to panic. We're going to be fine. Okay. Even though there's crazy people like that attorney running around trying to <laughs> impose harm on, on what's going on. There's no need to panic. We're going to be fine. Okay. So the overview, uh, I want to take you through um, a couple, the major points of this settlement. Okay. So uh, Scott Reich, one of our brokers, put this out to our group, and uh, basically this is the NAR settlement fact sheet. I'm not going to go read the whole thing, but let me just say the settlement includes brokerages that have below $2 billion uh, or below in revenue, and it, it, it involves a National Association of Realtors, so that's all of us who are realtors who have some type of realtor designation. So that includes us. Now, uh, there are about 16 to 20 uh, brokerages that have over $2 billion in revenue that are, that are independent brokerages that have over $2 billion. There's about 16 to 20 of those in the country, and they are still uh, potentially liable for lawsuits. So that doesn't cover us. We're not one of the top 16 or 20, so we're okay. But if you're in one of those bigger brokerages, independent they still aren't out of the heat yet. So the coverage of NAR's release, it, it covers all those members that I just remembered. It, it, it does not cover Home Services of America uh, that's listed in the Sitzer Burnett lawsuit um, So because they have not settled. And I love that. Uh, you know, I'm personally, I wouldn't settle, but the, 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 the reason why they settle, I know this because we've gotten uh, caught in this trap before, so many times it costs much more to litigate than it does to just settle. And so that's why a lot of times these brokerages will settle. The implications for brokers, brokerages, owners, members. Um, so uh, gives basically, I guess I already said that part. So uh, let me skip down here. Okay, here's practice changes. And I'm going to skip right down to the implications for members. There will continue to be a uh, many ways in which buyer brokers could be compensated. Uh, basically, what they're saying here, I'll, 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 I will read that that first section. We are uh, we were able to retain the right of consumers to, to continue to have cooperative compensation as an option, so long as they pursue it off MLS through negotiation and consultation with real estate professionals. This is critical, okay? What you have to understand is that we still have the right to offer compensation uh, for buyer's agents, okay? So um, NER has agreed to put in place a new rule 
prohibiting offers of compensation on the MLS, the change will go into effect in mid July. So that's the crux of this whole thing is that the offer of compensation can't be in the NLS. Okay. Very important to understand that. There will continue to be many ways in which buyer brokers could be compensated, including through offers of compensation communicated off MLS, as we have long believed that it is in the interest of sellers, buyers, and their brokers to make offers of compensation, but using the MLS to communicate offers of compensation would no longer be an option, okay? Compensation, fine. Listing it on the MLS, not fine, okay? Now, the types of compensation available for buyer brokers would continue to take multiple forms depending on broker-consumer negotiations, including but not limited to, number one, fixed fee, commission paid directly by consumers, number two, concession from the seller, number three, portion of the listing broker's compensation. So let me ask you real quick, and you don't have to answer out loud, but just answer it in your head. Uh, do you understand which, which of these do we do now? Well, we do all of them. <laughs> so there's no difference in the compensation sources uh, from uh, from listing brokers or, or for, for buyers agents and how they get paid. They, they've been getting paid in different ways, and they're going to continue to get paid in different ways. Compensation would continue to be negotiable and should always be negotiated between agents and the consumers they serve. So uh, this is not a big deal. That can, we know, those of us who are in the, uh, the real estate world, we know commissions have been negotiable. If you look across the board in different markets, they've been negotiated. There is no standard. None of us go to uh, you know uh, happy hour and, and conspire to get our commissions all the same. We don't do that. We do, do not conspire. That's not actually a thing, even though they're trying to represent it. So commissions will be done pretty much exactly the same, except for it won't be uh, promoted in the MLS, okay? So implications. After the new rule goes into effect, listing brokers and sellers could continue to offer compensator, compensation for buyer broker services, but such offers could not be com communicated via the MLS, okay? So, uh, basically making that same point. So uh, the, the next thing is that uh, written agreements, okay, the settlement uh, provides that MLS participants working with buyers must enter into a written representation agreement with those buyers. MLS participants acting for buyers would be required to enter into written agreements with their buyers before touring the home. Okay. Now I heard some agents say, oh my gosh, uh, I, I don't like to run my business that way. I don't want to have to run my business that way. You know, the, people are going to get upset and they're going to go to a different realtor. <laughs> well, guess what? All the realtors are going to be doing it. So uh, this is the new normal. Uh, this isn't our rule. And this this is the rule because of, of this lawsuit. So as we present that, you don't have to worry that you're the only one doing it. Uh, everyone's going to be doing it. Just like a, a consumer guide to agency relationships. I don't particularly like getting those signed, but now it's going to be like that, but maybe a step further and uh, we'll be explaining it a little bit more and have a little bit more detail, have more commitment. Okay. Um, so then uh, they talk about why they did the settlement. Uh, one of the critical advantages of this agreement is that NAR would be able to pay the settlement over time. So NAR would pay $418 million over approximately four years, okay? So why are they doing this? Why does this make sense? Well, if they were to appeal, a win on appeal would only uh, have addressed the verdict in the Stitzer Burnett case, not any copycat cases, and may only have resulted in a new jury trial, leaving members and consumers without continued, uh, with continued uncertainty. So there could be more lawsuits if they didn't settle this and put it to, to sleep. Uh, they could have gone Chapter 11 reorganization, but that also would have left members with continued uncertainty and potential liability. So, so that's why they've they've gone this route, and uh, that's uh, that's that's how we've gotten into this spot. Okay, so the quick overview of this is that the buyer's agent compensation can no longer be displayed through the MLS. Buyers will now be required to sign a buyer's agency agreement prior to viewing a home. 
$418 million settlement over four years comes out to about $65 per agent per year for the next four years. Okay. So if they were to bump our fees by $65, that wipes out the, the amount of money. Okay. So really it's not a big deal if if it's just a part of being a part of the, the board or the National Association of Realtors. Whether there's value to being a part of it, that's another conversation. Well, that's probably another Zoom call, <laughs> but I won't be uh, covering that in this one. But uh, just that being said, it's not a big financial burden like some have supposed. Uh, and this is actually what you have to understand. This is actually being driven by the Department of Justice. I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, I'll show you a couple articles uh, if I can find them. Uh, basically, several years ago in 2021, uh, the Department of Justice was basically uh, they were trying to cause problems about this clear cooperation. They were going after NAR. And NAR settled out of court with them, with the Department of Justice. They came up with a settlement, came out with some disclosures, and everything was fine. And then the Department of Justice tried to, to go back on their word on this. They tried to say, well, we've decided not to stand by our agreement. However, a federal court ruled in the favor of NAR back in, in 2022 uh, regarding this settlement and required the Department of Justice to uh, stick to the, the settlement. Well, the Department of Justice wasn't happy about that. So they've been coming after uh, NAR since then. And even as of recently, when all of these other big brokerages have been settling on this lawsuit, the Justice Department said that it's too too little. We don't want that. As a matter of fact, you know what the Department of Justice was pushing for was to make it illegal for uh, listing agents, uh, sellers to pay the commission of a buyer's agent. They were trying to make it illegal. So what we've got now in this settlement is, is way better than that. I hope you understand that. I am not a fan of NAR. However, I have to say, in light of, I mean, standing up against the Department of Justice, this is not that bad of a deal, considering they were trying to push out the possibility of it at all. So now we can still have cooperative commissions between the listing agent and the buyer's agent. We can still do it. We just can't state it in the MLS. So to me, that's that's not as bad of a deal as it could have been. So, uh, so buyer's agent compensation, um, you know, it's it just can't be in the uh, MLS. It's driven by the Department of Justice, and so I think that even though I'm not a fan of uh, National Association of Realtors, I would say it's a victory uh, in this situation. Uh, so, so here's some random thoughts. Okay, this is a huge victory that offers a, offers of compensation can still be offered. Okay, uh, this is good that we can still do that. Uh, buyer's agent agreements are going to be the new normal, and that's okay. Uh, the key will be to learn how to present these uh, buyer's agent agreements. You've got to get good at that. And we're going to be training our agents in these uh, by through weekly broker agent masterminds. If you'd like to be a part of that, send me a message. And even if you're not a part of Plum Free, we'll let you join in, no problem. Uh, but we, we're going to train our agents on how to present these buyer agent agreements at the highest level. Uh, so you have to understand anytime there's a crisis, anytime there's chaos in the market, there's always going to be opportunity. Okay. And what you have to understand the, the lowest tiers of, of agents are not going to do the work to do this well. But if you're on this call, I, I feel like you're probably one of the top 10% or top 20% of agents, and you're probably willing to do the work. So you're going to be fine, okay? So you'll you'll be the, one of the ones who actually learns how and figures out how to present a buyer's agent agreement in a way that's appealing and gets buyers to come on board with that. So it will be critical to uh, conduct an elite buyer's agent representation presentation. Uh, top agents have already known this and they've been doing it for decades, okay? So in my world, um, I, I heard on one of the Facebook groups, uh, an agent saying with these uh, buyer's agent agreements, I heard one of the agents say, 
uh, oh, suddenly offices are now uh, much more important again. And I was thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll do a buyer's agent consult consultation in an office, but that's not my vibe. That's not how I do things. Personally, a top notch uh, buyer's agency agreement presentation, I'm, I would do that at Starbucks. And so here's the way that that would look in my world. Someone would say, hey, you know, maybe it's a Zillow lead or something like that. And uh, they'll say, hey, Chris, uh, we'd like to take a look at 123 Main Street uh, this Thursday. Are you available? And I would say, yeah, yeah, uh, let's definitely do it. If you don't mind, let's meet uh, a little bit early at Starbucks. Uh, the, you know, we're now required to do a little bit of paperwork and kind of explain the process. So let's meet, I'll buy a coffee and we'll, I'll talk you through the process. So what you want to have then is at least a one sheet or a flyer or a brochure or something that very concisely and clearly explains buyer agency representation, okay? You want to make sure you know you can present it, and I would present it in like 10 or 15 minutes, and I would explain the complexities of a home purchase. Make sure they understand this isn't like buying a car. This is a complex thing, and you are there to walk them through it. You, you've done it you know, dozens of times or hundreds of times, and you're going to help them get through this journey in a very smooth way. And, and make sure they understand there, there can be lots of problems along the way, but you're here to help them navigate that, to make sure they don't get into trouble uh, along the way. And you're going to help them. Uh, you're going to make sure they don't get into trouble with that property uh, because, you know, there could be things that are... Uh, come up of a legal nature, or maybe the documentation isn't done correctly, but you're there to help them through that process. So, so I would work very hard uh, to develop a process for explaining uh, your, your your worth and uh, explaining the process and how you're going to help them through it. As a buyer's agent, I would make it clear that there will be over 36 people who will touch the transaction between a time of contract is accepted and the time the deal closes. So it is a buyer's agent's uh, responsibility to make sure all 36 people are moving forward in the same direction to get the, the deal closed uh, properly. As a buyer's agent, I would make uh, I work to gain respect uh, for the complexity uh, of the real estate transaction. So uh, a couple other random thoughts. Panic will cause some agents to jump out of the, the race, okay? Some agents have already started jumping out. They're watching all these headlines in the news, CNN, New York Times, MSNBC, and they're, they're like, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end. The sky is falling. And it's going to cause some agents to be fearful and they'll jump out. But that's good for those of us who stay in the game, okay? Don't give up. Don't get out of the game. You know, if, if, if we lose 20% of the agents, that means there's going to be more opportunities for you if you stay in the game. So don't get out of the game. Uh, there were still, here, here's something that's important. There's still going to be the same number of transactions. Even after July, <laughs> there's still going to be the same number of transactions, uh, regardless of the number of agents who are involved in it, the same number of transactions. Somebody's going to be earning commissions. It might as well be us. <laughs> so never stop uh, going after those commissions. Uh, so, and it's also going to be critical for listing agents to communicate to sellers how commissions work. So they're, so you go to a listing appointment and they've heard, oh my goodness, I heard we don't have to pay a buyer's agent anymore. This is great. <laughs> and, that, and it's the same thing as be, be, before all this came out. They didn't have to buy uh, pay a buyer's agent then either, really, because you know the minimal commission uh, was a dollar to put a listing in the MLS. Did you see very many listings that were for a dollar compensation for a buyer's agent? No, the market was was demanding, requiring higher commissions for buyer's agents, and I have no doubt the same thing is going to happen. So, but we have to communicate that as a listing agent, say. You know, don't get too excited. Uh, those buyers agents, they're the ones with the buyers and they're the ones who are going to be showing your property and they have to be paid and that's going to come from somewhere. OK, so uh, we're going to have to brace ourselves because of the media giving out false information. We're going to have to brace ourselves for some awkward conversations over the next several months. 
Okay. As a listening agent, I would work hard to communicate how critical it will be to cooperate with a buyer's agent. Now, here's a statistic that I think is very important. 70% of homes listed in the MLS uh, offering a commission of 2% or below 2% for the buyer's agent, 70% of them never, ever sell through the MLS. Okay. So that's important. I would I would share that with a seller. If I was on a listing presentation and they're coming up with this great idea, I would say that's fine. But if you're going to try to not pay a buyer's agent, you're eliminating the market of people who use a buyer's agent. 70% of homes currently that list that give a less than 2% commission to a buyer's agent never sell. So do you want to sell it? Okay, we have to cooperate with buyer's agents. So that's the pitch I would give to those uh, individuals. Keep in mind that commercial real estate is already run like this. So buyer's agent commissions are different for every deal and the buyer's agents have to sort those out along the way for each transaction. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind, uh, we're just not allowed to put it in the MLS, but we can put it in other areas. And one of the ideas I've heard recently is what if we put it in showing time? What if we list the listing uh, or the buyer's agent commission and showing time? And that's just one idea, okay? We're only at like 72 hours into this thing, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so, so we're still trying to figure this out, but there's going to be plenty of ways that we'll be able to communicate. Uh, how many of you have seen the meme going around where they're, they're talking about a funny way to code it into the wording for the mark, marketing remarks? I think that's great. Uh, but, you know, in seriousness, there will be ways uh, to communicate that. Okay. So here's the adaptation, adapting for success. Here's our plan for our agents. And you're welcome to uh, go along with this uh, in your own world. Uh, but starting with, uh, there's going to be an elite buyer agency presentation. We are going to train our agents to dominate in this category of doing buyer agency presentations. Okay. Uh, there's going to be the signed agency agreements. And, and we want to make that a, we want to explain it to them so well that they are excited to sign these agreements with our agents. And then you as an individual, uh, over the next several months, uh, you should focus on personal growth, training, coaching. What skills can you develop to make you a better version of yourself? Okay. And then I would say, uh, we're and we're pushing for this with, with our agents, focus on listings. Buyers are great, no problem there, but we're going to focus on listings, focus on building a listing agent. So our goal is to build an army of listing agents who are dominating in every market that we touch, okay? So it's fine to be a buyer's agent, but if you are a listing agent, you're going to make an end run through and around all these problems, okay? So, uh, and then I would say, watch for opportunities in the chaos. So there's going to be other opportunities that we don't even know about yet. So be watching for those opportunities. Every morning you get up, check the news, watch what's going on in the market, uh, try to figure out what are, uh, you know, what are some changes? What are some opportunities? What are some pain points for buyers and sellers? So be watching for those opportunities and figure out how you can fit into that. And then focus on building relationships. Nothing will get a signed agency agreement, uh, get, get this signed easier than having a relationship with your client that you're trying to work with, okay? And then buyer presentation brochure. If you don't have one, you must get one of these. And we're, we're developing a, a, a version of this based on the current uh, culture the, in real estate we're developing a new buyer presentation brochure as well as a video. Uh, we're going to have a video. So if you get a buyer lead, we want our agents to be able to say, hey, uh, in preparation for getting together this Thursday to look at that house, I wanted you to see the 60 second video, which kind of explains the process. So uh, we are in the process of creating that. And it's going to be very high quality. Uh, a video like that, by the way, is a quality signal. So you as an agent, you want to be communicating 
quality signals? What can you do to communicate that what you do is is always at the highest quality possible? Video and uh, uh, written presentation uh, brochures, these are two excellent ways to do that. So uh, the final thing I'll just say is there's probably been no time when it has been more important to be part of a 100% commission brokerage than right now. Uh, this is the best model for dealing with market setbacks and uncertainty. So that's my little infomercial uh, for Plumtree. If you are considering other options, a different way to do real estate, uh, give me a call. I won't uh, bury you in that, but I just wanted to mention it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up uh, for questions, comments. Um, actually, let me start out with Scott. Uh, Scott Reif is one of our brokers, and I'm just curious, Scott, as other people are starting to, you know, they're going to uh, ask some other questions and thoughts. Uh, Scott, what are you, some of your thoughts about uh, this whole thing? Well, we're, we're part of history. We'll, we'll look back on yeah. this and say, you know, before the NAR settlement and after the NAR settlement. So um, that's a, you know, we'll... we'll it's a defining moment in, in real estate and things are definitely changing. If you love change, <clears throat> you're going to love this. This is a, uh, this is a time where we're going to see a lot of it. And like you said, uh, disruption often creates opportunities. There's going to be new ways to approach real estate. I liked your idea of the video uh, for the buyers, a presentation and, you know, perhaps agents could come up with their custom version, you know, use the, the company version as an idea, but come up with their custom version and then send that out to folks before that uh, initial showing. And, and then follow it up with maybe dot loop to send out the buyer agreement and um in, in the consumer guide agency if they don't if, if they don't have the chance to meet them at a coffee shop before the showing yeah that's great that's an excellent idea and one, one of the things i'm thinking is i i don't know how much latitude we'll have with that buyer agency agreement but my idea is definitely to turn it into the something that looks like a brochure like something like this is exciting here's how we're going to help you not a state form. You know, we have too many state forms already. So making it look like a, a well-tuned, uh, uh, designed brochure. And hey, here's what we have for you. If you don't mind, take, take a moment to sign that. Right. Um, but I could see oh, buyers being hesitant at signing that. It's sure. like saying, hey, we're going to start dating before we even met. So <laughs> you could even make that first buyer's agreement, maybe a very short agreement. Um, or maybe, you know, it depends on, I'm sure that document's going to be revised between now and then, but it would be nice that the agreement could be either a, a limited duration or specific to a property. That way you can have a chance to see if there's a good fit in uh, working with this buyer. If they like you, if you like working with them, if it's going to be a fit, if you, you know, they're they're buying in an area where, where you're working and, and before you sign a a six month commitment to be their agent. Another thing is, I think a lot of buyers could be driven to call a listing agent directly. And as agents, we need to remember that doesn't always mean we're going to be dual agent. If, a, if we have a, a sign and a, a buyer calls our number on the sign and wants to see the house. So first of all, great thing about Plumtree is your phone number is on the sign. It's not the uh, the brokerage's phone number and uh, your phone number is on the sign. You get those calls. So when you get that call, you can still represent the seller. You're, you're the seller's agent. And then they are your client. The buyer that you're taking through that house is your customer. And you make sure you disclose that up front. But we want to be careful. We don't want to abandon our client and, and then become dual agent if we're showing a house to someone that we just met for that transaction. Yeah, excellent. Great, uh, great uh, insight there, Scott. I, I always count on you. That's terrific. Uh, I, I see a hand. Uh, I see that hand. Alex, uh, hold on just a moment. I Before Alex, before you ask your question or give your input, 
Marcy and Perry, I wanted to hear from you, if you don't mind. Marcy is one of our uh, top leaders up in Northeast Ohio. She's, everybody knows Marcy in Northeast Ohio. She's been building a great business for decades and she's been around the block. She knows a lot of stuff. So would you be willing to share some of your thoughts and uh, reflections on this whole thing? Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate being included here. Um, when I heard the settlement, I was actually excited because I'll tell you a little bit of history. In the, in the several decades I've been doing this, um, I consider my job as a consumer advocate. And I've always cared about that consumer experience at, at no uh, risk to myself. I knew that if I made, you know, $1,000 or $10,000, I was always there to help the consumer. And one thing that came to mind um, at the very beginning of my career was that when I listed a home, if I was charging, let's say, a 7% commission, I always explained to my seller that the commissions would be based on their net offer. So many times <clears throat> a buyer may need to finance their closing costs. And unfortunately, the language around that whole experience is that the lenders want us to write into the offer this crazy idea that the seller will pay the buyer's closing costs. Well, you know, as well as I, the seller never pays the buyer's closing costs. But when it's phrased that way, you end up having to mislead the seller thinking they are actually paying the buyer's closing costs. And that, I think, is the crux of where this whole thing started. If the, if the seller's paying for the buyer's home warranty, if the seller's paying for closing costs, all of those are concessions and the commission should never be paid on the total sales price. So I picked a fight with the MLS about 16 years ago, and I put in the um, broker comments about my 3-2 split for the co-broke that it would be paid on the net offer. And the MLS contacted me and said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. The commission has to be paid on the full sales, sales price. And I explained, you know what? My listing agreement says it won't be paid on the full sales price, and that's the agreement I have with my client. Well, I took it all the way to OR and NAR, and they shot me down. So for the past 16 years, I've been waiting for this to fall out, and now it has, because the greed of it all is is just ridiculous. Um, my husband and I were just explaining to my accountant, I went to pick up my tax return today, and he was giving me condolences about my future in this business. He said, oh, I'm so sorry for your, your upcoming year now that you won't be paid to, to sell, to, to uh, show houses to buyers. And unfortunately, he had just read an article in the Wall Street Journal, and that's where he got his, his information from. It's hysterical how bad the news is, the, the misinformation the fake news, the false, the false news. And we, as consumer advocates, really need to explain to everyone we're in front of, our friends, our family, our customers, our clients, how this business works. Because we wake up unemployed every day. We work without the promise of a paycheck. We spend money working on helping our clients, whether we get paid or not. And so if anybody needs, you know, an advocate here, it's us. We need an advocate. And I really applaud you, Chris, for putting together a brokerage that has all of us, at, you know, at your heart. You know, you're working for us. No other broker has done this for them. I've seen some of the little messages that have gone out as a poor, ex poor attempt at explaining the NAR settlement. But this is just really thorough and deep. And I and I applaud you because that's wonderful. We all need this information. So I, um, I I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity to be here at Plum Tree and to be part of such a, a vibrant business. This is an ecosystem. You know, the real estate industry is an ecosystem and it's full of all kinds of variables. And right now there's a lot of pollution in our ecosystem and it's going to take some time to weed that out and figure out how to move forward. But this is a great step in the right direction. So thank you. Cool. Uh, great input. I knew you would have some great insight as well. And uh, thank you for being willing to share that. Um, next, uh, Alex, I know you've been waiting patiently with your uh, little digital hand raise. So <laughs> uh, what's your question what, or comment or input? Can you hear me? Yes. Got you, man. Nice. 
Um, so I just want to piggyback off Marcy too. The misinformation. Um, I've had a, like several clients now text me about this uh, set. You know, this uh, NAR settlement. And they're under the impression that they're not going to have to pay, uh, you know, the other side anymore. And then conversation, like you said, is going to get awkward when uh, we have to explain that if the sellers aren't offering compensation, uh, that they would have to cover it. And they're going to think that what they got to pay out of pocket for it. So I could see a ton of hesitation on that. So I you know, was wondering if you could elaborate on that, too. Um, and then also that might put us in a position where we've got to do dual agencies. And I know, I think in Florida, that's, um, you can't do dual agency sales in Florida. So I don't know how that's going to work out. And just, I could just see a lot of, um, lawsuits coming out of this, uh, and a lot of liability, uh, again, as a listing agent, if, if the buyers directly want to call, because I, I already have, uh, clients that have done that kind of behind my back and just call the listing agent directly. And I think that's going to be the case more now. Um, also, I don't know if you're familiar with CoStar, but they apparently they were funding a lot of this NAR lawsuit. And I know that they've got uh, homes.com um, as the, uh, you know, the domain name. And I think they're going to be pushing some sort of system, um, you know, to essentially try to eliminate us all together. So I don't know if you could elaborate on any of that stuff. I know it's a lot, so appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, easy stuff. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not easy. Um, yeah, very complicated issues, actually. And what one thing I'll say is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this isn't the same thing as buying a car on Craigslist or on Facebook Marketplace, okay? Even on Facebook Marketplace, people can't even hardly buy a car without getting ripped off. You know what I'm saying? So with real estate, there's there's going to have to be professionals in the middle of it helping navigate people through the process. So uh, I don't believe our role is going to go away. It's not a simple transaction. It's a very complex transaction, and it, it takes uh, professionals in there to help people through it. That's one of the things I'll say. If I was uh, working with a buyer or a seller, if I was doing a listing presentation, and, you know, we're getting through the whole thing. And at the end, he says, hey, I've heard I don't have to buy uh, or pay for a buyer's agent anymore. Uh, what I would say is, well, you know, we charge. Here's the way I would do it. I, you know, to list your home, uh, I charge 5%. Okay. That's split evenly between the buyer agent and the listing agent. So that's two and a half, two and a half. If a buyer comes to me directly, I would list it, I, I would take a 4% commission. So that saves you some money, gives me a bit of a bonus, and that's that's how we do it. Any questions? So that's the way I would say that. And, and, and you might ask the question, you might say, well, I heard we don't even have to pay a buyer's agent anymore. And I would say, well, uh, buyer's agents don't work for free. And if you want to only work with buyers who aren't working with an agent, that's going to eliminate a vast majority of the market because the vast majority of buyers are going to want representation. So are you okay with that? So that's the way I would handle that process. But what it's going to take from our agents, I, I would encourage you to script it out. Be be prepared for that, uh, that pushback, okay? Spe especially over the next six months because the news has totally misconstrued what the truth is about this, okay? So I would I would script it out. I would write out what's that answer. I would have it uh, worded exactly the way I want to say it, and then I would uh, I would present it to them in that way. And uh, but personally, I'm not going to list a house just like I wouldn't before all this came out. I wouldn't list a house for three percent. That's not worth my time, and I'm not going to split that between a uh, myself and a buyer's agent. So uh, you know, if, if they want to find an agent to do that, just like they could have done it before. Uh, they can go try to find that agent now. But I don't think the market is going to uh, determine that that's the right pricing. And sometimes they're talking about how, well, like Catchmark, he said, oh, you know, we can go over to Africa or we can go to Australia and uh, there aren't buyer's agents. You know, you just go to the listing agent. Well, if you go to those countries, I don't know, have you ever tried to find a house in one of those countries? It's almost impossible. They don't have an MLS like we do. And, and people in that country are saying, man, if we could only do it like the U.S. 
<laughs> and so they're wanting to do it like us. And we have people like this that are wanting to do it like these other countries. And, and it's absurd. So uh, ultimately, I think we need to just uh, establish our value as a listing agent or as a buyer's agent. Understand there's going to be some turbulent waters over the next uh, six months as we try to work through that. But eventually, the market's going to determine the pricing, and I think it's going to be fine. Okay, I think we're going to be fine. I don't think it's going to be much different than it is today. Just like the market determines the price of a gallon of milk. You know, if you go to UDF or if you go to Kroger or you go to Walmart Supercenter or whatever it might be, milk's going to be about the same price. And that's not because they're uh, colluding. That's because that's what the market is for a gallon of milk. And I think the market will establish our value in that same way. So I'm not, I'm not that worried about it. Does that make sense or any other questions related to that? I wanted to mention, Chris, if I yeah. can, if let me say this, um, I've always worked with the buyer's agency agreement and I explain it in a way that I call it a loyalty agreement, just like a seller signs an exclusive right to sell so that only one agent represents them in the marketing and procurement of an acceptable offer. I work exclusively for that buyer. So I ask them, please don't call any agents names on signs. Just let me know you want to see the property and I'll make sure we get in to see it. So if we talk about it in terms of loyalty, and take away the fear of what that buyer's agency is all about, it, it commits them to your professional standards. So you have to put your money where your mouth is and say, I am a professional and I'm, you know, educated and maybe designated and I have, I have the cred, I have the street cred and whatever. I have a brokerage who supports this best practices policies. And I think that if we just get our mind uh, wrapped around that loyalty agreement, the buyer's agency won't be so frightening. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And the way I word it, similar to you, I, I say, hey, if you'll commit to me, I'll commit to you and we'll get you a heck of a deal on a house. So yeah. I, you know, I just want them to commit to me before I commit to them. And, and professionals have been doing this for decades, so it's not really a new thing. But Frank Ferraro, I'd love to hear, it sounds like you have a question or some input there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes, I think um, we've always approached commission the wrong way. We stated it to the seller that we're going to charge 6% and we're going to, and then we're going to take half of that and give it to the, the you know, to the other agent. But we should have been telling them that they're, we're charging them 6%. Six, six Frank Farrell's charging 6%. And these are the things I'm going to do for you. I'm going to uh, do advertising, open houses, and I'm going to offer 3% of my commission to, or, you know, a percentage to the other, to the world th that I'm going to pay them, you know, $6,000 or whatever it is to bring a buyer into my listing because it's really your listing, you're getting the money. And this way they want to come up to this thing that the buyer, the seller is paying the buyer's commission. The seller is not paying the buyer's commission. The, the agent's getting all the commission, every dime of it. And he's offering it to any, bu any buyer's agent that brings somebody in. He's, he's paying the other agent, not the seller. And that if we would have approached it all the time that way, we wouldn't be in this predicament right now. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Frank. And I think um, I think you're uh, you're personally you are well positioned. Uh, you're way ahead of it. If you're thinking that way, that's such a great way to frame it, and uh, you're going to have great success even with the change. I'm, I'm sure. So thank you for sharing that. That's really great insight. Appreciate that. What else? Any other thoughts hey, or comments? Yeah, go hey, ahead. Chris. Yeah, um, I guess from day one, I've been with Plumtree now since 2020. And we have always, or I have always gotten exclusive right to represent a buyer agreement signed from day one, as well as my listing agreements. I'm having exclusive right to sell. And within those agreements, all the commissions and the commission splits are spelled out and it, it just makes it so much easier. So if I've got a buyer 
who signs the agreement that says that I get paid 3% and the seller decides, and I've done this where the seller didn't want to pay any commission. The buyer knows it. They agreed to paying me the 3% up front. And it's not a problem because we already got it taken care of up front. Now, I don't know. It's been easy for me because that's what I've always done. Maybe, maybe I'm a good salesman <laughs> to get people to buy in. I don't know. But um, it seems to me like that, that in and of itself is getting those exclusive right to represent agreements signed is, is very crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent input there. I think you're right. And uh, framing that is uh, very important. It sounds like you're doing that right. And I don't see anything changing, you know, as you move yeah. ahead and have that same conversation. The only difference is you can't market in the MLS. That's it. You know, everything will be the same. You just can't advertise it in the MLS. We're pretty sneaky. We'll figure out other ways to get the word out. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that um, we have we have a lot of opportunity. And I think things, things will work themselves out. Yeah. Alex, what other... Uh, question did you have looks like you had another thought. A couple yeah a couple other thoughts too i think uh in our p positioning our value um the people that end up wanting to go directly to the listing agent i think conveying that you know you want representation you wouldn't represent um you know yourself in court obviously and um this is usually people's biggest purchase of their life and so you know you want to be uh, fairly represented and not, you know, a, a lot of these listing agents will do whatever just to get the deal done. Right. Are they fairly represented or, you know, are you, um, so just, I, I'm just kind of trying to think of ideas, especially with this buyer agreement. I just can see a lot of pushback when we have to talk to them about, um, you know, if, if the seller doesn't provide, um, compensation, then, you know, they would have to pay for it. I just, I don't know you know, I just feel like that's going to be a tough one. You know what I mean? Well, one of the things I would, um, I would probably choose to soften the buyer's agency agreement compared to the way it's written now. Um, and I know they're different in different areas, but uh, the way that the buyer's agent agreement is written now is if you don't, uh, if you find another one, uh, I might sue you if you go outside of me. And if you don't pay my commission, I'll sue you. And we actually had an agent before that was that was wanting to sue your clients uh, for that. I just, I felt icky about that. I just, I had a hard time with it. And uh, I would probably soften it a little bit. And, and I'm sure there'd be some people who'd say, well, Chris, you're not as good of a salesman. They're probably right. But I, I would focus on the relationship and say, look, I, you know, I'm here to help you. Uh, I'll, I'll work my tail off for you. And I would try to uh, build build the value of it, so they would say, "Man, I'll I'll pay you whatever you want uh, to to do that." The other thing I, is, I would say, if I was working with a buyer, I would say, "I'm uh, I know this says that you, you'll pay for my commission, but we, number one, we don't have to look at houses if they're not willing to pay a buyer's agent commission. We don't have to look at them." Uh, number two. Uh, I'll, I'll try everything. If, if you find one that they're not necessarily offering a buyer's agent commission, I'll, I'll try everything I can to negotiate it. So they're paying it. So you don't have to. And uh, so uh, try to build their trust in that way as well. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, I actually, yeah. Hey, Chris. Um, I actually had a buyer that I was working with that, they did sign the exclusive right to represent. And at the end of the day, they ended up, it was an older couple, um, kind of a cantankerous, ornery old guy, but <laughs> he, um, he ended up going and finding a property that was a for sale by owner and he bought it. And of course I didn't get my commission after I had him in contract on another property that actually fell through due to an inspection. And, um, I mean, I didn't pursue it to go after him. You know what I mean? It was like, you just let it go. It's, it's not worth the effort to create enemies. And 
I think at the end of the day, I, I still had good rapport and relationship with the guy. And, um, unfortunately he passed away here recently, but, um, it's just one of them things, you know, you just, just consider it part of doing business. You, you win some, you lose some, hopefully you win, win more than you lose. <laughs> and in my case, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And I, I agree with that. Looks like uh, Dana, uh, feel free to jump in there. And, uh, looks like Dana has a important question or comment or something to say there. You there, Dana? And also, uh, Svetlana. Looks like Svetlana has a question. I don't know if Svetlana. Okay. Anyone else have a question or comment? Input. <laughs> hey. All right. Anything else? Oh, Maxine. I got it. Here. Let's let Maxine go there. She uh, was trying to get my attention. Go ahead. What, what you got, Maxine? Um, so, so, you know, I do investors. I really am an investor, a realtor. That's pretty much all I do. Um, but I had a question in regards to um, do, because this part I don't know. So do we have to tell our, our um, sellers that we are going to split our commission with the referral agent? Is that something that we have to do? And then can we create a separate agreement with the listing agent for to split our commission with them? Uh, this starts to get into that world of uh, legal advice that uh, I, I'm not I know, I know. Get. However, in my non-legal advice, uh, my thought is that we would just disclose it in the listing agreement like we always do and just say, yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't see a difference in that because that rule hasn't changed. The only rule that's changed is promoting it in the MLS. So right. I, that's and I, I, was, I was just thinking. Yeah, I was just thinking about it like, well, do they do I have to tell somebody what I do with my commission? <laughs> I know, because if you hire a landscaper, he's not telling you he doesn't have to give you a list of who's getting paid. Right. So right. it seems to me like we wouldn't have to. But uh, I, I, I feel like they're going to want us to. <laughs> gotcha. Any That's other? It. Thank you. Yeah. Selena, did you have? something to say yes so um i have been on reddit quite a bit yesterday the day before and today and we just need to do a little bit better at telling people what we do how we can actually help them because a lot of people are really dissing on buyer agents saying that we are worthless and we need to do a little bit better with telling them where our worth is how you know we do things and i tried to take a little bit of time out of my day today this morning um writing basically a book, um, basically yeah. explaining everything, what happens with our commissions, what's going on with the buyer's agency and how, you know, we actually do help them. And like, uh, there was this one point in time, I'm pretty sure um, that, that some of you remember it, me, I had to look it up, um, where buyer agency wasn't a thing and the consumers were getting basically, excuse my French, screwed by the listing agents because the listing agent works for the seller. And that's why buyer's agency came to be. Exactly. So, that's a great that's point. Important. Yeah. You know, and another, po another point about if you're the listing agent and you're taking all the sign calls, then you're sell then you're showing the home to more than one customer at that point. Where does the contemporaneous offer rule come in where you're where you're representing more than one person for the potential purchase of the same property you know where's the the, the fine line between ethics and and legal right because that's not a good idea to, to write two offers on the same property for two different people so yeah, yeah being be, being a dual agent on your own listing can be very cumbersome but we can always refer that out absolutely i think that's uh, to a partner good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And uh, Azra looks like uh, might have a question for us. 
He might be muted. Let's see if we can get that unmuted. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my question is like I have I have seen like both being the seller side and the buyer side. So if you are representing a seller side, it looks like a win-win situation. But if you are in the buyer end, so yes, agency agreement is a must. But my question is that there are so many loopholes. Like, what about the VA loan? Because VA is hundred percent. You know, um, it's uh, like commissions are. You cannot negotiate commissions. Uh, what about the FHA and USDA? You know. So uh, how are they going to kind of you know uh, those who are USDA and FHA? So there is three percent, and um, sometimes it's hard to get money three person put together, you know? So how are, are the banks are going to put something a reserve, like put that commission fee, uh, but then if the bank is going to add that, then most probably the appraisal are not going to come right. So how are they going to structure that? And the third question is that um, like I represent a lot of people who are asking for grants, Ohio grants, so if they are having Ohio grant and they are not making a lot of money, it's hard for them to come up with 3% uh, for FHA. How come they can um, offer a commission? So basically, doesn't it kind of conflict with the fiduciary duty as an agent or like fair housing? So that is a lot of questions coming up, but how kind of like, how things are going to work forward. That's my I think those are, those are great questions. And I think all of those uh, come in. There's two, two points I would make about those. One is um, if, if they're going to stick with this, it's going to require a complete restructuring in the industry. However, uh, if you boil it down to what was in the settlement, the only difference is that it can't be, the compensation can't be advertised in the MLS. I believe based on these different scenarios you just laid out, the market is going to require the compensation to come from the uh, seller side, just like it always has. Uh, and, and so uh, that's going to come through the listing commission. I think that's going to cause listing commissions uh, to stay high so that the listing broker can still pay the buyer's agent just as we always have. It might look a little bit different, but I think the market's going to require that. Uh, so that's that's my take on all of those things. I think they fit into that category. So, um, Maxine, I see it looks like you might have another question. So feel free to jump in there. Are you there, Maxine? And if not Maxine, Michael and Harriet, if you, looks like you might have a question. Yeah, this is actually Harriet. So okay. um, I didn't mean to turn on my video. I'm sorry. I'm getting over a cold. Um, I had a question because I've been using the new state of Ohio contract. And in the state of Ohio contract, we don't put commissions on there at all. So now if there's no commissions on the MLS, where do we put the commission? Well, uh, it's it's going to be, you're, you're talking about the state contract. It doesn't talk right. about, are you talking about the listing contract or purchase contract? No, the purchase contract. Yeah, it's that's what we're, uh, that's going to have to change. There's going to have to be some other document that's created, uh, maybe an addendum or just a commission agreement that's going to have to accompany or precede uh, the sending of an offer. So um, that, and that's all going to have to be ironed out because I don't think they've got answers for all of that quite yet. So, uh, but that's, uh, stay tuned, attend our uh, weekly training events and we will be bringing updates as they come. So by the way, if you're on this call, if you haven't already uh, signed in with your name and, and brokerage, you don't mind put that in the chat section just so that we know who was here that way you'll get make sure you get an a get credit uh, for the class today so <laughs> okay any other svetlana 
I see you're in there. I don't know if you have a... Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. Oh, finally, I figured it out. Okay, so Chris, you mentioned uh, earlier that if, when we work with buyers, for example, we wouldn't have to show properties to them that are not willing to pay buyer's agent commission. But again, that would be something starting in June, I guess, that would not be disclosed on the MLS. So again, how would we know? <laughs> what properties to show them and wouldn't that, that uh, be against their best interest? So how would we go about that? Well, I, I feel like there's going to be, um, I don't know if you're here uh, towards the beginning of the uh, session, but uh, I think there's going to have to be some system of communicating uh, what the commission is. And just an example of a way that it could be done would be uh, potentially through showing time. Uh, it could be listed with the, uh, through the showing time instructions, that's not prohibited. Uh, or there could be some other way uh, that that we communicate it. But uh, I think it's just going to have to be some way that we do it. Um, when you're the other thing is, uh, if we if we don't come up with that way of communicating it, uh, the it might turn into sort of like they do in the commercial real estate world, where if you're going to show a commercial property. Uh, you have to call the listing agent ahead of time, say, hey, if I bring a buyer, what's how does the compensation work? Oh, there is none. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I've worked this out with the buyer first uh, before. Uh, or they might say, uh, well, they're, they're open, it's negotiable. So you send over a commission agreement to the listing agent prior to showing the property. So it could turn into that, but that's, you know, the problem with that is residential being different than commercial you might go out and show 10 or 15 properties on a Saturday. So then you're having to get all these commission agreements nailed down before you even show properties. That's how residential is different than commercial. So, so essentially <laughs> it's doing a little bit extra due diligence on our end and again, yeah. creating more work on for this uh, listing agent as well. I think it might be more work uh, initially, but I feel like we're going to create some type of system uh, where it is uh, streamlined. So does that make sense? Certainly. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Uh, Micah, looks like Micah might have a question for us. Micah Har. Um, I had a really quick question. If we're adding the fee, whatever that is, on top of the purchase price of the home and the house fails to appraise, I see a issue with the commission or the fee being the first thing to try to be struck out of the deal and the VA buyers who can't per VA guidelines pay a buyer's agent regardless. I see those as two very big issues. I just kind of wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. I, I agree with everything you just said there. And I think the, the points that you just made highlight uh, the absurdity of this new approach. <laughs> I think I think it's ridiculous that, that they're putting us through this uh, because it's really, it's hurting. It's going to hurt VA buyers because they're either going to force them uh, to go unrepresented uh, or they're not going to be able to get the properties and they won't be, be able to afford them necessarily. So, so I think if this sticks and they, they make it uh, so there's no way to communicate a commission coming from the seller, I, I think the VA, I truly believe the VA will restructure things to allow their buyer to be able to uh, pay a, a buyer's agent. I, I just don't think the VA is going to hamstring their own people because of that. Uh, so that's the one side of it. Um, the first question you had had to do with uh, if it doesn't appraise, and I think you're also nailing one of the key problems with this uh, new approach. If it doesn't appraise, uh, the buyer's agent commission may be one of the first things that gets nixed. And uh, that would highlight how important it is to get that uh, buyer's agency agreement signed because it, it will be a contract that you're going to get paid. Okay, so... Uh, so that's the guarantee that your commission won't be uh, just thrown out the window. So does that make sense? Money out of a rock. And a lot of first time home buyers are barely able to afford their down payment and their closing costs, let alone my fees on top of that. 
Yeah. It's not there. I mean, I'm working with a client right now. First time home buyer. They're getting a grant. They have $400 in the bank. They're not going to be able to pay my fee. Right. <laughs> it's just not there. So I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's I think it's rotten. And I, I think what you just described also shows that the people who will be hurt most are the people who need it the most. It's going to be people, first time home buyers. It's going to be people uh, you know, that, that are living from paycheck to paycheck, that are just barely scraping to get into the, their home. Uh, those people are going to be hurt potentially by this. Uh, the the upper five uh, percent of Americans, they'll be fine. You know, they'll just pay it. Uh, but the lower fifty percent uh, are going to really struggle uh, with this new. Uh, they'll struggle unless we can figure out a system where they'll still be paid. Uh, buyers agents will still be paid through uh, the sale from the from the seller through the listing agency. So, to me, that's the answer. It has to has to be like that. Uh, Emily and Stephen, uh, looks like you might have a question. Thanks for having this topic. Yeah, that's what's sure. kind of funny about the DOJ pushing this through is that they're hurting the you know the lowest of incomes and affordable housing the most. So it's just kind of crazy. Um, so much for question, consumer protection. Yeah, <laughs> right. So why would why would they be the ones spearheading it? My question is, what about now? We're working with buyers now. We're Buyer, we have buyers in contract. I mean, does this affect anything that we should be concerned about now? Nothing for right now. Uh, in July, uh, that's when these things will start to. And I, uh, I would guess it'll be the signing of documents that begins in July. So if you get documents signed in June, you'll be fine. If you get documents signed in mid July or August, then that's when it will have to comply with the new rules. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I'm working with lots of buyers, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Dana, looks like maybe Dana has a question or so. What you got there? Can you hear me this time? Yeah, sorry about that last time. Um, no, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to know what your opinion of NAR is at this point, and if you think that realtors should get out of it, or we should start looking for something, some other type of representation, or if you think we were well represented in this case? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's a lightning bolt. I, ha I have to say, I think doing this settlement, I can understand them doing the settlement. However, uh, I don't know if any of you listened to the or read the transcripts from the uh, courtroom hearings and the NAR attorneys never even cross-examined the, the witnesses or the people, uh, the plaintiffs. They, they never even cross-examined them. And, and I was thinking, what, what is going on here? It's like they're laying down uh, for this case. It just made no sense to me. Uh, like I, I had a thousand questions I would have asked them. The, the NAR attorneys did not. And I, and I was just thinking, who, who are they serving? Like, what, what are they doing here? What kind of game is this? Well, I and, mean, we all, we all pay into this. And it's like, is it really worth it? Are we getting what we're paying for? And are they really fighting for our careers. No. Yeah. I, uh, since the beginning, I've always been an anti-NAR person. Uh, it just has seemed like a monopoly. It has uh, screamed antitrust to me, <laughs> which is ironic uh, that they're getting busted for that right now. Uh, but, you know, just the fact that they require all agents in an office to be a member, uh, like if the broker is a member, every agent has to join. Or if one agent wants to be a member, every agent has to join to have access to the MLS. The broker has to be a member of uh, of the board of realtors, and then every agent in that office has to be. If one agent gets behind on their payment, they'll suspend the entire office uh, from the MLS. To me, that's just like such blatant antitrust uh, stuff that just makes my head explode. So I I would tend to be anti NAR. I would tend to say, let's if we could all exit, I would exit tomorrow. But the problem is having access to the MLS. Right. But Do I you think, think there will be another type of association created and possibly another platform outside of the MLS because of all of this? Right. Yeah, I, I do. I think that there's going to be other alternatives soon. 
Uh, state MLS is one option right now. The problem with joining the state MLS right now, even though they're in every area, is that if a realtor wants to schedule a showing, uh, they don't know how to log into the state MLS if they're not already a member. So they don't know how to show the property. And uh, so it gets kind of complicated if they're not. It's okay, sort of like we're not all in it together, it. then it's hard to, to market and show properties unless everyone's in the same one. Could you say that again, please? It's probably hard to market and schedule showings for properties if we're not all in the same local MLS for that area. So everyone has to either be in the state or in the local in order to work together. I think that's true. And uh, but they but, you know, that's it's true today. But I wouldn't be surprised if they come up with a workaround where you can list properties in it and still be able to access them or show them even if you're not a member of it. So uh, if something like that happens, I think there's going to be a mass exodus. And I think we're sitting on a precipice of that. I think it's not far ahead because so many people are uh, disgruntled and and uh, disappointed with the, the role of NAR right now. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's my two cents worth anyway. Any other thoughts or questions, comments? Hey, Chris. Yeah. Hey, one thing, one thing that I was um, talking about with my um, instructor, the owner of the Ohio Auction School. He's a he's a a real estate broker and his auction business. And I, of course, I've got my auctioneer's license. And I was talking to him one day. And, um, he was like, you should just get your broker's license. And I talked to him a little bit about the deal we have and everything. And he goes, well, it's actually a pretty good deal. And I said, well, that's, that's why I came with Chris and that's why I'm still here. But, um, he was telling me that he said he has to really believe and think that there's really no advantage to being a member of an MLS now. He said, as times are evolving, he said, you still got your Zillow's, your Realtor.com's that you can, those platforms to to blast your listings out on. And he was like, why? He said he sees in the very near future a, a mass exodus from the MLS's. Yeah, I, I, I can picture it. I think that's definitely a possibility. So uh, it, it'll be interesting. And uh It'll be interesting to see where it goes. So um, I, there's a couple comments in here. Um, what, one of, somebody asked if uh, we're going to be, uh, if we're recording it, we are recording it. So we will send out a replay uh, to those who registered for it. So if you're here, uh, if, if you're also, if you're interested, if you don't mind, uh, throw your email address out there uh, and your name in the chat and we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, one comment, if the NAR attorneys were on our side in keeping with the spirit of the plaintiff's lawyer, instead of taking a big percentage of the winnings, he should go to each plaintiff in the class action to get the port, get a portion of his fees. So that's a great point. Appreciate that. That's, that's a good point there. Uh, several other comments here. Um, hard to get through. It looks like hundreds. Uh, one one question: Do you think prices of houses will go down uh, to accommodate the buyer? I really don't think that will happen. That's a tough one. I I think I don't I don't think it's going to cause pricing to go down. Pricing tends to be very closely related to supply and demand, uh, and I think uh, listing agent commissions are going to stay in the in the realm of what they are now because I think buyer's agents will continue to get paid. And uh, so I, I don't think there's going to be a big change in all of that. So um, yeah, so lots of good questions. Um, uh, not sure we can get through all of those today, uh, but uh, we do do this uh, every Monday. If you took the time to be on this call today, uh, happy to invite you to future uh, broker agent masterminds that we do on Mondays. Uh, so make sure you send me a note, uh, maybe put it in the uh, chat section there, and we'll make sure you're invited to future uh, trainings. So 
Uh, any other uh, questions or comments before we go? I got a quick question for you, Chris. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know, so this, uh, I think I might've missed some stuff, but so this is like, is this supposed to be like a ruling or it definitely is going to happen to where we cannot um, see the uh, BAC in the MLS anymore in July? Uh, that's basically the essence of our training that we did today. And we are, uh, we did record it and uh, I'll send that to you so you can see it because it, it's not an easy answer. Um, it's kind of complex. Uh, the, the short answer is uh, we can still offer commissions. We just can't advertise it in the MLS, uh, but there's a lot more to it. So I'll, I'll send you the recording so you can see that for sure. So cool. Okay. Any other thoughts before we close out? All right. Well, thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Great to have a great crowd and I uh, wish you the best. Go out there and, uh, knock some home runs this week and uh, go out and make some money. Let me know if I can ever be a help. Uh, happy to help out in any way I can uh, with your business. So have a great week. Thanks, Chris. All right. You're welcome.